is, uh, my name is Professor Matthew Mazur. I'm in the history department. And um, I sent him a little bio. I don't remember what I put in there, but uh, it's my own life, so I should be able to remember. Um, I've been here at St. Anselm for about 15 years. Uh, I teach courses on the Vietnam War, American foreign relations. Uh, I teach a course on the Cold War, and I teach courses on modern China and modern Japan. And Today, I, I want to spend a little time talking about St. Anselm in 1969 and 1970. And before I, I get started, I just wanted to, to, to say thank you to Peter and Megan and Patrice for, for putting this together and for doing all the, um, the hard technical work. And uh, to Paul, Casey, and George Neary, who are with us as well. Um, and they'll be commenting after I say a little bit about uh, what was a really busy year on campus 50 years ago. Um, and I think Peter was going to mention that this is in no way meant to uh, replace the alumni weekend activities that uh, many of you are missing right now. Uh, this is a little bit more of like a, you know, an appetizer or a preview of something we'll do later. Um, and I can, if Peter has anything else he needs to say now that he's back, I can turn it back to him. Thanks. Sorry about that, a commuter connection. Uh, I did want to just quickly introduce you, Matt, and, and our other speakers. Um, Matt's uh, primary area of research is U.S.-South Vietnamese relations. Recently, he has published essays on the pedagogy of the Vietnam War. He was the editor of Understanding and Teaching the Cold War, uh, University of Wisconsin in 2017. Professor Mazur joined the St. Anselm faculty in 2004 after earning his PhD at Ohio State University and a bachelor's at University of Michigan. At St. A's, he teaches courses in American foreign relations, the Vietnam War, the Cold War, modern China, and modern Japan. In recent years, he led small groups of students on short-term study trips to Cuba and Vietnam. Matt lives in Concord, New Hampshire with his wife and two sons. Paul Casey and George Neary, our other speakers, are co-chairs of the class of 1970 50th Reunion Committee. Paul graduated from St. A's in 1970 with a degree in history. At St. A's, Paul was on the debate team was active in Big Brothers and the King Edward Society and served as student body president in 1969-1970. Paul did his graduate work at University of Virginia, receiving a master's degree in 73 and a law degree in 77. Paul recently retired after a 38-year legal career in public finance and affordable housing law. He lives in Ellicott City, Maryland. And George, George Neary, is a class of 1970 history major currently retired in Miami. At St. Anselm, he was the social chairman who booked the live bands and all the big weekend acts during his senior year that we're talking about. He also served his country as a Peace Corps volunteer. He was a marketing VP for AFS, Intercultural Programs, and was a vice president for the Miami Con uh, Convention Bureau, traveling all over the world, promoting Miami. George was the 2018 recipient of the St. Anselm College Alumni Award of Merit. And sorry for the interruption, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Mazur. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. I, I tried to uh, take over in, in your absence, <laughs> but you did much better. Um, so the, uh, very quickly, the, this, this presentation grew out of a, a, a project uh, that I worked on with a, a student. It was, it was a faculty student research collaboration that we started last summer. Um, it's something that we're, we're trying to do a lot of at St. Anselm, um, really you know, finding ways that students and, and faculty can work together uh, on these projects. Unfortunately, the student who was involved, Declan Kiley, who did great work, uh, he couldn't be with us. He's, he's um, uh, been very busy hiking. Uh, he spends a lot of time hiking the whites, and so uh, he left this, this to me. But, but he really did a lot of the, the legwork here, so I'm relying um, on, on his research. Uh, the other person who was involved and whose, whose work was very important to the project was Keith Chevalier in the library. And many of you have encountered Keith at one point or another, but he does a great job on um, campus history. And as for this project, he uh, digitized the, the crier run of 1969, 1970, so we could use that uh, as the basis of our, of our research. We had other library resources that we used. 
and he helped uh, Declan uh, and me conduct oral history interviews with Paul and George and a few other figures uh, from that time period. So our original purpose was to examine the fallout of Kent State at St. Anselm and the idea being that this is the 50th anniversary, uh, I guess it was just about a month ago, was the 50th anniversary of Kent State. And um, we were interested in how the campus was affected by Kent State specifically and the events in Vietnam more generally. Uh, but in doing the research, we got more sort of a glimpse of what was happening on campus during this really momentous year. And it was uh, uh, actually a very tumultuous year uh, in many ways. And especially in the past few weeks, we've been thinking how this seems particularly relevant today, uh, looking at what's going on uh, on campus during a time when there was a lot of unrest, a lot of disagreements. And, um, you know, perhaps we can learn something from what was happening then. So my, my plan today is to look back at a few of the key events uh, and issues from that year. And I'll show some images from the crier to kind of illustrate what was going on. And then at the end, I'll offer a few observations uh, as a, a historian who's sort of looking at this um, from a much later time period and as a bit of an outsider. Uh, and it's, it's a little bit nerve wracking for me to, to, to talk about a time period and we have people here who are there, uh, you know, their, their view of what happened might correspond with mine, it might not, um, but that's something that, that, uh, that we deal with. Um, so that's sort of the plan and, and I'll start by putting up this PowerPoint, if you just give me a moment to, to share. Okay, so the, the dates on the left will uh, generally be the dates of the crier issues, not necessarily the dates of the events themselves. Um, this is, is an image from, from the, uh, the beginning of the 1969-1970 of the school year. Actually, I'm gonna back up a second. This was the cover of the crier, the first issue of the crier uh, of that school year, and it uh, the the crier was was uh, documenting the the upcoming moratorium demonstrations that were scheduled uh, nationwide in in the fall of 1969. Uh, this was a nationally organized series of demonstrations against the Vietnam War, and you can see here it was uh, splashed on the crier above the fold. Um, there were activities in Manchester. There was, there was a, 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 a march in Manchester. Uh, according to, to our research, and I think this came out of one of the oral history interviews, uh, classes were not canceled for the march, but absences were excused uh, because it took place on a Wednesday. And the second slide here uh, shows how the union leader covered the same event, the, the, the uh, moratorium in mid-October. And uh, you can see at the very top, the, the union leader's view was, was pretty clear, um, essentially telling demonstrators to you know, go away, stay out of Manchester, uh, don't um, besmirch Manchester with their presence. And I think this points to not just a, a sort of a town gown conflict uh, in the area, but the, the real divisiveness of the Vietnam War. Um, and again, this is something that, that I think we're very familiar with, and, and it's, it's not something that's unique to the late 1960s. Uh, it's something that the country, you know, has been going through these, these convulsions for, for quite a long time. Uh, one other image from the crier here. Uh, this was after the moratorium, and um, this image shows the flag flying at half-mast uh, during some of the, of the activities that were actually on campus uh, as part of the moratorium movement. Uh, the Vietnam War obviously loomed large in 1969 and 1970, and something that uh, several of the alumni mentioned to us was the importance of the draft lottery. So uh, at this time, as part of reforming the, um, uh, the criteria for uh, drafting soldiers in Vietnam, we moved to a lottery system. And uh, in talking to alumni, you really got a feel for the, um, the emotions that were involved with knowing that your future, your fate would be determined by this, you know, kind of like random outcome, this, this chance drawing. Uh, and here the, the crier once again, uh, sorry, this is, this is one other uh, image from the, um, the events of the moratorium. Uh, this sort of shows some of the pictures from campus and from Manchester, uh, and it includes a statement from Father Placidus about the demonstrations. Uh, and actually you can see the the headline, which actually comes from Father Placidus, is um, sort of a contrast to what was in the Union Leader at that, at that same time. Here's an image that, uh, that comes from the crier from a little bit later in the year, from, from the winter, and it, it describes the, the draft lottery. And it provides info that was meant to help 
these students, these young men, understand what their draft number meant. And you know, if, you, if your uh, draft number was low or, or in the middle or high, what that meant uh, in terms of the likelihood that you could be called up and you could be sent to, to Vietnam. Um, and if you, it's a little hard to see because the text is small, but uh, one of the St. Anselm faculty members who was involved in helping to counsel students to provide information about the draft lottery was Bill Farrell from the sociology department. And I'm sure while many of the people who are watching may have had him for class, I mean, he was at St. Anselm, I think for uh, about 50 years himself uh, by the time he retired, maybe even a little more than 50 years. So I, I met Bill when I first started here uh, and, and his name pops up throughout the year because of his involvement in, in these sorts of, um, uh, of activities. So clearly the moratorium in, in the fall and October, the issue of the draft lottery itself, which took place in the winter, these were, were big topics on campus. Uh, but not everything that was going on was directly related to the Vietnam War. This, this is what drew me to the topic, but in doing the research, I, I started to see these other things that were happening. Um, one thing that, that, uh, that came up, and, and I think George may talk about this a little bit, is that uh, there were a lot of cultural activities that were taking place on campus. 1969-70, of course, but, but the previous years and the subsequent years, uh, in, in the winter of 1970, in early 1970, uh, the birds performed at St. Anselm. They played in, in Stoutenburg in the gym. Uh, I was a little surprised to, to, to learn about this because I didn't realize that, that names of such prominence came and performed on campus. And I think that had a lot to do with, with George's work. He was uh, giving me a list of some of the other performers who came to St. Anselm during this era. And, and it was a lot of the biggest names. Um, and it's, a, it's hard to imagine in, in a, a building the size of Stoutenburg having performances by bands, you know, like the birds. I mean, that would, would have been uh, quite an opportunity uh, for students at the time, and not just St. Anselm students, but students from, from other neighboring uh, colleges and universities. Uh, one of the other really, really big issues that came up, and it was sort of a social issue, but it's also a political one. It has to do with the identity of the college and, and college policies, was um, the rights and responsibilities uh, of students on campus. And that was not just a St. Anselm debate that was taking place in the late 60s. This was a nationwide question about how colleges would, would uh, determine the role of students. Were they simply there to learn and be subjected to certain rules and, and policies, or would they have a voice in uh, determining the character of the institution? And that came up at St. Anselm. Uh, from reading the, the issues of the crier, I learned that uh, there was a sort of an ongoing discussion about whether students we would know that. Out to participate um, on, on college committees, whether they would right. have people on, on college committees. And that, that sort of went back and forth, um, but it was, it was a way to show that students would have more of a voice in the issues that affected them uh, as, as uh, young people. Uh, another issue that came up that had to do with the, the rights of students and their role in, in college administration was the timing of graduation. And, and we learned a bit more about this talking to George, uh, that the students wanted graduation to be held on a Saturday so their families would be able to attend and they would, you know, it would be more convenient for them. Uh, and that was something that they had to work out with the administration. And at that point, that meant really working it out with the monastery. Um, but probably the single biggest issue of this type uh, in 1969 and 1970 had to do with parietals, the issue of parietals, or the rules that dictated intervisitation uh, at the dormitory. So basically the question of whether uh, people of the opposite sex would be able to, to visit the, the dormitories. So in this case, whether women would be able to visit the dormitories where, where men lived. Um, throughout the year, students, I guess I would say sort of pressed the monastery to allow for some degree of intervisitation. So to create some kind of parietal system or parietal rules. Um, at least during some defined periods. And, and this, the resolution of this, of this uh, um, disagreement was, uh, or let's say this, this request on the part of the students was that parietals were granted during certain weekends of the year, especially these social weekends when there are social activities taking place like winter weekend. Uh, but this was a, was a dramatic change on campus. And I'll show an image here from a, a cartoon, a, a cartoon that was in the crier. And, and I don't know if Paul, um, or George remember this. Uh, this is from, you can see it's from, from February, from early 1970. And it's, it shows, I assume, assume these are meant to be students. Um, they are, they're willing as, as the, the um, attached article stated to 
get down on their knees and beg, if necessary, to have Father Placidus and the monastery and, and the little chapter grant the right of parietals uh, to students, which, which the monastery did. And this, um, I think, revealed some degree of, of common understanding between the students and the monastics about you know, finding a, a bit of a middle ground. So this was interesting, and apparently this cartoon was a little bit uh, controversial, and, and I think the fact that it showed a monk with his head in the clouds uh, may have been part of that. But um, for those of you who went to St. Anselm since the years of 1969 and 1970, uh, you can thank people like Paul uh, and the, the, the monks at the time for, for you know, coming up with the solution and creating a system of, of parietals that allowed for some degree of intervisitation, still with restrictions, but at least, at least it was allowed. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about, and I'll, I'll mention this very briefly because I want to make sure we have time uh, for questions and answers, was what happened at the end of the school year. And it's actually, it's where the project began, uh, but it's where I'll, I'll wrap up. Um, as many of you probably know, in the spring of 1970, after President Nixon announced the invasion or incursion into Cambodia, there were demonstrations uh, in the United States. There were demonstrations on college campuses. Uh, one of these demonstrations was in Ohio at Kent State University. During the, the demonstration, the National Guard shot on, on the demonstrators and four people were killed. And that just prompted more demonstrations. So by early May, uh, especially on college campuses, there were, there were students who were, who were demonstrating to protest not just the war generally, but specifically the, this abuse of power uh, at Kent State. And St. Anselm had demonstrations, students did search for, 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 for solutions or, or for um, uh, activities that they could, that they could do to, to sort of register their dissatisfaction. Uh, that included things like teach-ins, um, hunger strikes. Uh, students demanded that they be able to forego their final exams in order to you know, pursue these, these uh, um, uh, political activities. And this led to uh, an optional strike which you can see here. Um, and I'll show another couple pictures that show the campus quad here. Um, the, by all accounts, these moments were quite tense. And, and this is May 15th. This is the, the crier issue that shows the, the pictures that the, the actual demonstrations came about a week earlier. Um, by all accounts, the these moments were quite tense and there were there was talk about you know turning these peaceful gatherings into violent gatherings there were discussions about going down to um uh, the national guard building on the the at the bottom of the hill on the you know at the bottom of st anselm drive which is now the the, the politics institute and and you know vandalizing or burning that building um but but the the violence never really took place i mean the the, the demonstrations remained civil uh here's one other image and in talking to Paul, he attributes the civility of these demonstrations in part to the fact that during the entire school year, the student body and Paul as, as, as a student body president and the, the, the administration, Father Placidus and other members of, of the monastery, they had had to work out different issues and they had established a bit of a, I guess we might say a rapport um, in trying to figure out how to um, uh, minimize conflict on campus or at least find a way to you know, through mutual respect and conversation, uh, craft some kind of solutions to these problems. Uh, and that kind of got me thinking about maybe a, a couple of sort of broad observations that I would make about this time period after, after having done some research and, and having talked to, uh, to some of the members of the class and, and spoken with Declan about, about what we found. Um, the first, and I alluded to this already, is that the Vietnam War was obviously a very big deal in 1969, 1970. If you were going to college in, in this year, if you were a senior or a freshman, or if you graduated a few years earlier, a few years later, um, this was a, a, a huge issue. It was an enormous issue. And in some ways, it, it affected the other issues that were part of, you know, sort of like the, the climate of the time. At the same time, if you read through the crier, if you talk to people who were on campus in 1969, 1970, you realize that, we're, that there were many other issues that had nothing to do with the Vietnam War, or at least were not directly related to the Vietnam War, such as the question of parietals. I mean, in a broad sense, these are about, you know, sort of like cultural changes and about, you know, protest and students' rights. And so I guess there, there are some connections to things like, you know, the anti-war movement. But I think in a more narrow way, the, this issue of parietals or intervisitation, which was a big deal for students in 1969 and 1970, was really divorced from what was going on either you know, in Washington or thousands of miles away 
uh, in Southeast Asia. So that gave me a, a bit of a new perspective on campus uh, at the time. And the other thing, and, and I just mentioned this towards the end uh, when I was talking about the, the, the um, uh, events after Kent State, is you know, it was clear that this was a, a tense time and there were obvious tensions on campus. Uh, but in general, the, the climate on campus remained civil. Um, and it was constructive. There was this feeling of, you know, we can work out our differences, right? Our, you know, there, there, are, there are differences about a host of issues, but these differences don't, you know, fully divide us. Um, and talking to Paul and George and others, I, I think this really is a testament to the strength of the St. Anselm community. Um, I think they'll be the first to admit that they had some very strong disagreements with members of the faculty, members of the monastery, other students, uh, and yet they, you know, they managed to avoid the sorts of conflicts that, that, uh, um, that erupted elsewhere. And so I don't want to be too heavy handed, but perhaps this is a bit of a, a you know, a, a lesson that can be kind of instructive today. I mean, we're, you know, we're living in a time when we feel like these divisions are tearing apart the country and perhaps we can look at the way people navigated these things in the past to, if not learn some lessons, at least maybe have some hope or optimism that it won't be so bad uh, in the future. So that, that's uh, sort of my quick overview. I think that gives us plenty of time for, for question and answer. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, I think, turn it back to Peter. Thank you, Matt, very much. That was terrific and uh, stay tuned, obviously. We had four questions submitted in advance or four topics that people wanted to hear more about. And I'd start uh, perhaps with Paul. Uh, Matt spoke about parietals, which is kind of a, almost a foreign term nowadays, 50 years <laughs> later, but it was a big deal back in the 60s. And uh, perhaps you could explain uh, what parietals are and what happened during 6970 with students and, and the monks. Well, well I, I, thank you, Peter, and thank you, Matt uh, and George. Uh, Matt gave a very good explanation and we can drill down a little bit, but in a, in a nutshell, Parietals really refer to the rules and regulations that govern the visitation of members of the opposite sex in a dormitory or living condition. Um, and frankly, St. Anselm's didn't have any. You, you couldn't go into the, op into the dormitory of a member of the opposite sex. And you know, maybe in the early years we were there, it wasn't quite as much of an issue because the women weren't on campus, but the women moved onto campus uh, with the dormitory that is now down, um, off of the main big quadrangle down below where the, uh, where- uh, St. Saint Joan of Arc. Right. St. Joan of Arc. That, and um, anyway, uh, when I wanna underscore what Matt said in resolving this issue, uh, this was probably the, 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 the single biggest issue at the beginning um, when I was student body president. There were, there were two. One was the, the appointment of students to university boards, which Father Placidus and I worked out. We met several times, we talked about it, we had some differences. Um, we ultimately compromised uh, and, and we managed to get the students on the, on the key boards. Um, and, and what established that dialogue, in that dialogue, I think was what Matt talked about, which was a relationship of mutual respect. Um, yes, there were differences, but I think there were also areas of accommodation and respect. Um, and in talking about parietals, I think it's one thing I want to mention is that I, I think the, for the monastery, it was something quite um, quite incompatible, or at least many monks thought it was incompatible with the Benedictine philosophy of a Catholic college to have members of the opposite sex meeting in their dorm rooms. Um, and I remember, and I think it's because Father Placidus and I had a dialogue, Father Placidus invited me to meet with the little chapter, which was the really the, the governing board of the school. We had a trustee board, but that was advisory. The little chapter was made up of uh, the, the leadership in the, monast the monastic community and the leadership in, in, in the college and it was the prior and the sub prior and the abbot. And I was, Father Placidus explained that would be the group that have to make the decision. And I was the first student leader invited to ever meet with a little chapter. That was a big step. And I met with a little chapter and pleaded the case, made the case. Um, I, I'd forgotten about that, you know, that political cartoon about, you know, begging, which you showed us, Matt. But I, that probably dramatized a little more extremely, extremely than it was. I remember a very civil discussion. However, part of that discussion with a little chapter was an education on both sides. My coming to appreciate their concerns, but also 
I mean, they said, how can you let, you know, students meet in their same, in, the, in their bedrooms? And I explained that their bedrooms, their, 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 their offices, their, their living rooms, I mean, that it's the entire living area for a student. Um, and, and, and I think the other concern I tried to help them understand was that if you respect students and you give them responsibility and believe in them, then you ought to continue to do that even in this regard too. And so you're right, the ultimate decision, I mean, with a lot of, a lot of concern was that the monks agreed to give us parietals on social weekends. Um, and that was a big step for them, it was a big step for us. And, and quite candidly, I think the students handled it responsibly, but it was, it's strange to think now that we saw this as a huge kind of a, a, a revolutionary moment that we had gone from no visitation at all. We asked for more, by the way. I'm not gonna, we, we asked for, for, you know, visitation. I think, our, I think our request was for all weekends. We, we didn't want it, we didn't ask for it during the weekdays, but ultimately getting a, the consent to do it on, on, week, on social weekends was a major concession. And hopefully it laid the groundwork for what you say now, Matt, which is 50 years later, it's, it's not an issue anymore. But I don't think it would have happened if there hadn't been an atmosphere of mutual respect and, and a dialogue that Father Placidus was willing to invite and the monks were willing to, the, monk, the monastic leadership was willing to listen to. Um, and I do think that helped us later in the year when we were doing other issues. And maybe this is part of the Benedictine charism, well, where you live in community and you always, when you have chapter meetings, encourage participation by all members of the community and listen to them. Um, but it certainly was something that we benefited from uh, and, and hopefully continues so that you're, you're right. You, these ability to have dialogue in, a, in an atmosphere of mutual respect will help to resolve issues. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. Um, kind of tied to that, I think a lot of people uh, remember or were curious about the musical scene back then, both of music playing in the dorms, music playing downtown in Manchester, and music gatherings on campus. And George is sort of the, the fount of most of our knowledge about that as he was social chair. George, perhaps you could talk about that a little. Well, first of all, there was an amazing tradition established before we got there of bringing in large musical acts. Our, as freshmen, the first act that appeared at San Ace was the Four Tops. Now that was one of the biggest groups ever and we were like almost stunned. Uh, and then from that, we had Simon and Garfunkel, we had Judy Collins, we had Dionne Warwick, we had Stevie Wonder, we had Stan Getz, Herbie Mann, we had Smokey Robinson and the Miracles, and we had speakers like Dick Gregory, Tom, uh, Noam Chomsky, and Tom Rush. But what happened as I became social chairman, I mean, those are all wonderful groups, but they always lost a fortune. And I tried to figure out how can we have a weekend that we don't end up losing $8,000 or $10,000, as I remember clearly. So I came up with a plan working with Paul and others that I visited all the surrounding colleges. And for the first time, I met with their leadership and said, why don't you have your fall weekends, your winter weekends and spring weekends when St. Anselm does, and then we can sell you tickets to our events so we can continue to get strong groups and not lose money. Because what was gonna happen is as they lost money, we weren't gonna be able to get the name groups. And so for the fall of our senior year, we had a, a well-known group, Paul Butterfield Blues Band, because what happens is you have to buy the group in the spring and hope they're still together in the fall six months later when your weekend rolls around. And so what happened was we had an amazing weekend with Paul Butterfield Blues and all of these other participants buying tickets. for the. Uh, and then we had the birds, which you've heard about, which were phenomenal. And then in uh, the last group we had were the Friends of Distinction uh, were sort of like a, um, that, that, that group, that five, you know, Marilyn McCoo and Billy Williams, I can't think of all, the name of the uh, group. But, and uh, so we had all of these uh, uh, great opportunities. And, I, and also uh, we had live bands at the Stoutenberg and at the Cushman for, uh, for social events. So we were able to really continue a high level of musical quality that people really responded positively to all of those four years. And as I said, I think I left one out. We also had the association, 
So, I mean, when I tell anybody from a, a huge school, UMass, or, or they never had the quality of, of music that we had at St. A's. And I think that always was, was a real plus for all of us. And we were very proud of the fact that. But I, I just want to go and, and support Paul with, you know, we had to meet with the, 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 the executors of the college who were very positive about groups and acts and were not stopping us in any way from having uh, uh, some of these performers, which I, I want to mention was another uh, dialogue that we had with the administration, which um, I think set, a, set a, a, a foundation for us to work together for these other issues like parietals and some of the other issues that are going to come up during our senior year. Mm. Uh, one participant mentioned Ray Charles and the Rayettes as well, which he fondly oh. remembered. That's right. Right. I'll write it down. I'll keep this <laughs> list handy. <laughs> right. uh, while we have you on deck, George, uh, one of the questions and something Matt again brought up a little bit, people were surprised to hear that the graduation was not always on a weekend, but rather on a weekday. Maybe you can tell us a little about how that happened and what changed. Yes. Well, you had to understand the college mentality at the time. The monks were, uh, the priests, you know, the, one, the priests, not the monks, the priests that could say mass were loaned out to surrounding uh, churches and uh, parishes to say mass. So they felt that that was more important because they were making this contribution but we who met with uh, Father Placidus and others tried to explain, you know, we're coming from a middle class background and our parents would have to take time off from work on a Wednesday and a Thursday to drive to St. A's. And uh, it, would, it, it, it wasn't um, kind of a positive message that you're giving to the people who paid our, our uh, tuitions and what have you for four years. So after a number of meetings, they, for the first time, um, changed it to the weekend and we were able to have and then we began with the with the social committee to plan some events um, that um, w w occurred around the weekend so we had some social uh, opportunities for parents to like every other school could uh, participate in and meet their their children's friends and colleagues. And so that was the first time that ever happened. Uh, in, in, and it was an opportunity for us to, to uh, uh, have that. We did want to have it outside and we were assured that it was impossible, could never be done. Having it outside, they thought we were crazy. And of course, where does graduation occur at St. A's today? Outside. So those are the two kind of things that we pushed for, but we were very happy to move it. The other thing is we had participation in our senior speaker, and we did a, 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 a survey, and people wanted to have Edmund Muskie. So the school reached out to the, the senator from Maine who was running for president, and he was happy to come and be our keynote speaker. So we didn't end up having, as I say, some transportation uh, uh, secretary, but someone of a meaningful uh, importance, and that added to uh, a great feeling for our graduation. Thanks, George. I, I, would, I, would just add ahead, George I would just add to what George said, Peter, that uh, the graduation on the weekend, I, I think we actually had it on the, on the Sunday, but on the Saturday, yeah. We had, we had the very first honors convocation. They, they had the, the mass followed by an honors convocation. There hadn't been one before. And this was another way of the students saying, we want to be able to find a way to celebrate what we've done as students at, at, at St. A's in front of our families. And so it, it, it was, it was a, a major change. It's hard to believe it was, but right. so the fact that graduation may now be on, on, on a weekend with an honors convocation is something that didn't exist until 1970. Hmm. Right. Again, for me as a staff member, it's nice to hear that 50 years ago, in a very bitter and divisive time, there was compromise and, and dialogue on the hilltop. Hopefully well, could, it's a lesson could I just add, well. one of the things that we made sure we did is we brought many of the monks to eat with us at the cafeteria. So we had dialogue, we had assigned seats so that they wouldn't sit alone because, you know, people would walk in and maybe not sit. We made sure that 
they had an opportunity to meet some of the students and they'd never been invited before. So it was an opportunity for them to taste our food and also just to mingle with some of the other, with some of the nurses, with some of the other students. And I think it lowered the negativity. It began the dialogue. And I think they went back and thought, well, isn't, you know, isn't, wasn't that an, these are the monks that lived in the monastery, not the monks that lived among, on campus, but right. the monks that never got an opportunity to meet the students. And that was something different, something positive as well. Right. There were still monks living in dormitories, right? As, as yes, residents? Yes, yes. They yeah, were. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, someone asked about uh, Father Anthony and the draft card burning. Ah, I don't know yes. if it's either Matt or Paul, you want to take that one? Uh, well, Matt, do, do you want to, or I, I can also ch chime in? I'll just start very quickly, but Paul, I think you, you're, you're more um, familiar with, with it than I am, but uh, that is something that came up in our, in our research, <coughs> that Father Anthony, who had, who had been here at St. Anselm, although wasn't at the time, was involved in a, um, a draft protest in Milwaukee, which, you know, historically, this is, is an indication of, you know, again, just an, another example of, of the... Um, uh, the divisiveness of the Vietnam War, these anti-draft protests uh, suggested that, that there was, you know, sort of like great resistance to, to the war. And, and it showed that, you know, there were, there were concerns about the fairness of the draft uh, and obviously concerns from people who, who were eligible to, to be drafted um, that they might be sent to Vietnam. Uh, so I, I know, Paul, you know a little bit more about it. I will say Declan, when we were doing our research, he found a little bit of, uh, found out a little bit about Father Anthony and among other things, found that he's still alive. He lives in Maine, I believe. Um, so we, we were not able to get in touch with him, but, but he, is, he is still around. But I know you, you were more familiar with sort of what happened uh, right at that time in 19, I think it was 1969, maybe, or 68. I think it was, I, I believe he burned, I think the, the draft files were burned uh, either in the fall of 68 or the spring of 69. And they were, it was the second major draft card burning after the Catonsville Nine. It was the Milwaukee 14. Um, and, 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 and I think I'd like to begin by just saying that Father Anthony represented, I think, um, a, 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 the attitudes of a number of the monks, which I think helped in the dialogue that we were engaged in, because Father Anthony, Father Robert, Father Mark, Father Basil, Father Ambrose, Brother Joachim, these were all members of the monastic community that you could relate. I, I think that they were open to looking at things from a, a different perspectives and, and, and in some cases helped us in discussing concerns we had about the war. Um, in the case of Father Antony, um, his, I mean, his decision to, to burn the draft file, I, I actually took a course from Father Anthony as a sophomore, uh, which really was about finding Christ in the signs of the times. And I think Anthony felt very strongly that this was something he had to do. Um, and what I find, what I remember very distinctly is I wrote him a letter in prison after he was arrested uh, and I can remember getting a letter back in which he said he had never felt as free as he was behind the bars in prison. Um, and, and I think that, um, and, and I wanted him to come back as student body president to speak to the college. Um, he was not invited back by the monastic community, but the, but the student senate invited him back to speak. Uh, and he spoke to the, to the school in the fall. I can't remember, I think it was probably sometime in October or November, probably after the moratorium, but it was a very well attended uh, a, a, a speech in what was then the Abbey Theater, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, but it was, it, it was essentially uh, a way in which we could focus attention on why this was um, a legitimate form of protest and what it meant to make a decision to do something like that. And Anthony was, a, was an example of that. Um, and, and, and I think we want to be respectful. I mean, I don't, th there were divergent opinions. There were members of our class who, were, um, who, in, who, who volunteered to go to the Marines. I mean, we, had, we did have differences of opinion. Um, and we could express those differences. I mean, I had some very different discussions with members of my class who ultimately went into the military. Um, and again, what I think was, re was remarkable uh, was that we could have this kind of civil dialogue. It was great that Anthony could come back and speak to us and, 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 and let, let us look at things in, that, in, 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 a, in a way which said, you need to respect this, this point of view. Um, and, but I, and, and there was a clearly, uh, you know, uh, an effort at the campus 
to try to express those concerns of opposition. There was a there was a sleep in and a and a pray in at the church in in, in January with three with uh, three or four students. Um, and then of course there were the demonstrations both off campus with the moratorium, where in part because George had laid the groundwork in the spring of 69 for colleges in the community, Riviere and Mount St. Mary's and St. A's to get together on social issues, all the student body presidents had met. We actually coordinated discussions and planned for how we would participate in the march in Manchester. And exactly. I remember marching with, uh, with these other college representatives and students down the streets of Manchester. And actually, and I do remember being yelled at um, and, and uh, and it was there were some unpleasant moments in the demonstration, but it was it, there was a there was a large united group of students from the colleges participating, and the demonstration was very peaceful. I mean, there was no violence. It, it was it was a peaceful statement of our of opposition to the war, keeping in mind, of course, that there are there were divergent opinions, and but we were, I think, able to express our opinion, recognizing that there were others. Um, I also want to go go forward just a bit to, to talk about what happened in May. You mentioned what happened in May after the Kent State. You saw the picture, one of the pictures you showed was in the, in the quadrangle in front, of, in front of the administration building and a student was pointing downhill. There was a student Matt standing Cavallo. up. Yes, pointing downhill. Um, and, and that was the moment at which it was saying, we need to rise up. We had, we had students had, had gone and brought other students out of, out of their classes. Classes essentially were suspended just because students walked out. And the, the, the argument was we need to walk down, the, we need to make a statement. We need to walk down the hill. We need to take over the, the National Guard building, which is where the Institute of Politics is. Uh, and if necessary, we need to burn it. We, we, we can't have that symbol on our campus. And I remember very distinctly getting up in, in, as a student leader and speaking about a way that we needed to look at things differently. And, and frankly, I said, you know, that kind of reaction doesn't make sense. We need to be able to study what we're talking about and understand it and come to more reasoned approaches. And we can do things. We can still demonstrate. We can, we can suspend classes. And that was when, I mean, the, the, people, the faculty or certain faculty members and administrators were listening from the, from the inside of the building, the administration building. And I, I'm, Dean Kapowski came out, uh, Vince Kapowski, uh, and the two of us stood there and, and essentially um, worked out um, what amounted to a suspension of classes and a teach-in, which we had for three or four days. Students ultimately were allowed to either take or not take exams. They, they weren't required to. Um, so again, I but I believe what you said earlier is true. We had, during the course of the year, encouraged a dialogue and established a relationship, which I think even though there were differences, was still based on mutual respect. Even with, with students who may have felt that it was important to support the war, with faculty who thought that, or with those who didn't. Um, uh, and, and, and illustrating how that dialogue got promoted, just jump on something George said, when George said that we invited monks from the monastery to eat in the dining room uh, in our cafeteria, I remember when I made that comment to Father Placidus, we were together in meeting in his office, and I suggested that you know he could come down and eat in the cafeteria, and I wondered why he hadn't, because I hadn't seen him there. I hadn't seen him there in the years, in all the years I had been there, and he had been president. And he said nobody ever invited me. I remember right. that very distinctly. Yeah, exactly. And and I and I thought, you, do you really need an invitation? And I said, so you're invited. I invite you. Um, and 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 to his credit. He got, he, we left that afternoon and went down and ate. And it was a surprise to walk into the cafeteria with the president. But that was symbolic, going back to what George said, it's symbolic of the fact that we were willing to continue to dialogue and talk with each other and respect each other. Yes, we had differences, sometimes very strongly held differences, but we managed to negotiate and, and work out ways in which we could accommodate. And, and I respected the members of my class who served um, it was a tough. It was a tough time. The the draft created a lot of anxiety, um, but I think there were members of our class who also respected those of us who opposed the war. Um, and I do think, go back to Father Anthony, that he was in a way a kind of a of a symbol of the anti-war movement for us on campus. A very powerful symbol. Um, and Paul, I, I just want to add that um, 
when we were at the flagpole, there was a big fight over whether you put it at half staff or not. They were, a number of them guarding the pole because they thought if you brought it at half staff, it was, you know, detrimental and against America. But some of the monks came out and spoke about, you know, who had died and what happened. And that then diffused the situation. So the flag did come to half staff and people felt that we had achieved something with um, a collegial uh, acceptance. But there were a number of monks who were out there dealing with a lot of the more agitated students who they respected and helped calm the situation so that we didn't all jump up and go marching somewhere uh, uh, with with hatred. Right. Hmm. I, di I did note one of the chat one of the chat items is that there were monks living in the dorms and that's true. I mean that that did help. Uh, Brother Joachim and Brother Edward um, uh, and there were monks living in the dormitories, which helped right. to in, in create a community with the students. And I think that was very helpful. The, you know, the concern I had was that some of the monks, like Father Placidus, uh, who were more senior administration, had not experienced that kind of intimate contact with students. Um, and so I think that, that that helped. And I do think that we encouraged an atmosphere of dialogue. And I'm sure that the monks who lived with us in the dormitories helped in that regard too. It was easier to communicate with them. And I'm sure that when they talked, I mean, you know, something I, I would be curious to, to find out, and I, I don't think I ever knew, and maybe your research can discover this, Matt, but after we, I met with the little chapter and ultimately the little chapter said, yes, I'm wondering whether members of the little chapter on the parietal issue went back and talked in a chapter meeting. Did they, was there, you know, did they go back and talk to other monks in the monastery? Maybe talk to some of the monks who were living in the dorms saying, you know, what do you think about this? Um, but ultimately the decision was to do it. But again, I think it reflects the Benedictine rule. It reflects the rule of St. Benedict where you do, when you have chapter meetings, encourage everybody to participate. Uh, even the youngest. In fact, if I remember the rule correctly, uh, and you may, I mean, pe pe people now who are studying uh, humanities may know better than I, but uh, I think that in a chapter meeting, the youngest monk is allowed to speak first, or is, uh, because you want to encourage the comments from the youngest monk before they're influenced by the older monks. And that, that notion that you want to encourage dialogue pervaded that year. At least I think we helped to make sure that it did so that we right. didn't erupt because there were some campuses like Kent State that erupted. Um, ours did not. It could have, but it didn't. Yeah, that, again, that's very reassuring, very good to know. Several people wanted to mention Dr. Uh, Father Robert, I believe it was Robert Case. Yes. Right. Class of 1954, I, I'm in touch with him. He's still alive in Boston, retired professor uh, from Northeastern. It's a lovely, lovely man, very generous. Some of these, college, some so. of these priests and monks played a very important role in um, working with a lot of the students who felt uh, disenfranchised, if you will. And they really reached out to those students and tried to make them, uh, to, to speak with them and understand them. And there were about 10 of them uh, who were uh, very influential and very important in um, our senior year. Remember the goal, one thing is to graduate. We're middle-class kids. Our parents wanted graduation. We were the first students. So we didn't, even if there were demonstrations and protests, our goal was not to not graduate. Another panelist, and we'll wrap it up in a moment, wanted to mention Father Martin as well, Martin Magru, who's now yes. at Woodside. He's yes. very helpful to everyone. He was, Father, Father Martin actually was the, um, was the uh, proctor in our dormitory in Hillary our, for our freshman year. Right. Um, and yes, exactly. very approachable. And still a wonderful and very vital man. So yes, you know. yes. Um, I'm going to turn it back to Matt for any closing comments, and then we'll wrap it up. Again, I'll remind you that this is recorded so people can look after the fact. Matt? Thank, thanks, Peter. Um, I don't really have anything to add. I mean, this was great. Learning about the, the different monks, actually, for, for me, is very interesting, because that's the kind of thing I would not you know, encounter as much <coughs> research. And it is something that's kind of unique to St. Anselm. Uh, and we know it's such an important part of the campus here. I mean, when we're here, whenever you've been here, if you come as a student, as a faculty member, as an administrator, as a staff member, uh, that's a part of, of what stands out about St. Anselm. So that was really nice to hear some of those recollections about, about the specific monks. Great, great. And, and, Matt, and Peter, before we yes. say goodbye, could you say a few words about 
what we're going to do a year from now and include the class of uh, 1971 in this workshop with uh, Dr. Basur and, sure. and Declan. Sure. And so that way we don't lose that little thread. I know we do. We have several members of the class of 70 committee as well as classmates from 70, 71, and 69 on the call today. Uh, we do plan to do this same type of dialogue, but in person uh, at the reunion. It was going to be this weekend, but it'll be next year instead. Um, we're very committed to having a real dialogue with Declan Kiley, the, the student who did this research, as well as Matt uh, giving his, his guidance and inviting people to sit at round tables and talk about their memories of those times, about their memories of the war, and about the memories of, of St. Anselm and, and how they influenced themselves. So uh, this has been wonderful. Thank you to all the participants. I'll remind you again, this has been recorded, so it will be posted on the college website, the Alumni Relations website, so you can watch it again. Very appreciative to Matt, to Paul Casey, and to George Neary. Thank you all very much, and keep aware of other events that are coming up later in the week for alumni. So thanks very much. Have a great Thank day. You. Thank you.